Introduction, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my presentation about uh, mass density and viscosity sensors. I will start with our motivation right away. One point of our motivation directly comes from rheology. Um, so what rheologists normally do when we examine uh, complex liquids, they use, oops, sorry, they uh, use such uh, oscillating uh, measurement setups. And the reason why I show you this figure is that I want to show you that with uh, conventional rheometers you are limited to a frequency range which goes approximately from some uh, millihertz to let's say some hundreds of hertz. On the other side there's the well-established quartz crystal microbalance uh, which is operated in the megahertz range. So between these two devices there is a gap which we are aiming to bridge with our, uh, with our setups. And the second point is that we want to achieve to get viscosity sensors and not viscosity measurement setups. There's a big difference between that. And these sensors should enable low cost uh, manufacturing, also uh, allow uh, the manufacturing handheld devices as well as inline measurements, for example, in a production line. So now let me first give you an overview of uh, the principles we follow to uh, achieve this task. What we do have are uh, vibrating membranes, vibrating uh, platelets, vibrating wires or double clamped beams and such uh, yeah, cantilever-like, uh, such as singly clamped beams and uh, which are, have this U-shaped structure. Uh, in this talk, I will concentrate on such structures. So now let me explain the working principle for all of these devices. The easiest way to explain is, is by means of a linear, or mechanical linear lumped element oscillator, which is depicted here, which consists of lumped elements, uh, spring stiffness K, damping parameter R, and mass M. Uh, what is given here is the transfer function of the mechanical oscillator, which is uh, the uh, quotient of uh, deflection in C direction over uh, the forces acting on the mass. And to con consider for the effect of the liquid loading, uh, the lumped mass and the lump damping parameter are split up into the uh, into the mechanical oscillator's intrinsic parameter plus the liquid loading. What you see here are the uh, resonance curves of, of this uh, transfer function, for example, in the unperturbed uh, uh, state. Uh, if you increase the damping, of course, the damping in, uh, would increase, or if you increase the viscosity then, or if you increase the mass, uh, the mass density, the resonance frequency of your device um, would uh, shift to lower resonance frequencies. So how do we actuate and read all our devices? Um, all our devices carry or consist of conductive paths which are uh, placed in an external magnetic field. We apply sinusoidal uh, currents to these electric paths and thus we will uh, excite oscillations due to Lorentz forces acting on these currents. Uh, so what we then have is an electrical conductor oscillating in an external magnetic field which in turn will induce a voltage on these structures. And we have um, what is for example depicted here. For these two devices we, we use two paths, one for excitation, the other redout the other for readout and for these two devices we only use one electrical path. So we, we can use only one electrical path for excitation as well as for readout. And what we actually measure is the motion induced voltage with a log in amplifier and here you nicely see the quadratic dependence of your amplitude uh, on the external magnetic field. So now let me come closer to the viscosity and mass density measuring cell. Um, it's more or less a concept study uh, with which we wanted to, to answer the question if it would be possible to um, build a viscosity sensor as well as a mass density sensor based on the same principle and also approximately of the same size to be 
able later to integrate it uh, in one measurement cell. So what you see here, this is a principle. Uh, this you will see later on, on, on uh, in a photograph. Uh, this is a tube. We used stainless steel tube tubes uh, where we apply the current, and the magnetic field comes here from the front. So it, it would uh, start oscillating in this vertical uh, direction. So for the mass density the sensor, the liquid is inside. For the viscosity sensor, which is just a bent wire, we used a 400 micrometer thick tungsten wire. Uh, the mass uh, the viscosity sensor is surrounded by the liquid. So this is the biggest difference. Okay, liquid inside for mass density and for viscosity, um, the, visco uh, the sensor is surrounded by the liquid. So this is a photograph of the mass density sensor. Uh, here we see the stainless steel tube, which is clamped for a first attempt by two fiber glass. Uh, blocks and here you see uh, the permanent magnet which we use uh, for the magnetic field. Uh, this is a, fi a, a picture of a first viscosity sensor. Here you see the 400 micron thick uh, tungsten wire which is braced into two solid uh, brass blocks which is necessary to get very stable devices. This then would be uh, the, uh, the experimental well which I don't want to explain in detail. Um, so here we see the equivalent circuit or the excitation and readout circuitry. This part here uh, considers for the function generator we need and the part on the right with the 10 mega ohm considers for the 10 mega ohm input resistance of the, uh, the locking amplifier we are using. Uh, in most of the cases we use an additional uh, series resistance to limit the excitation currents to prevent from nonlinear uh, deflections. Um, and actually, the equivalent circuit of the sensor is just this part where we have here the motion induced voltage, which I explained uh, before, and the ohmic resistance of the wire. And as you can imagine, that we can only benefit from uh, this part for the motion induced voltage the uh, offset would be quite or relatively large due to the ohmic uh, voltage drop off of the device itself. So if this comes is bothering, uh, you can make a more sophisticated readout circuitry where you have, for example, a, re a reference wire which has exactly the same resistance. Uh, you use, for example, uh, a coupled uh, function generator. Um, and you would only then measure the difference between uh, both wires. So this wire is, is not moving, so you don't have a uh, motion induced voltage, and you eliminate the ohmic voltage drop off, so you could measure directly the motion induced voltage. So now let me show you uh, some measurements. These are the first measurements for uh, the U shaped wire as viscosity sensor in four different liquids and as you can clearly see what is given here and as you can clearly see um, higher viscosity yields higher damping and what is nice about this figure is that it already shows that this uh, sensor is, is uh, quite stable so what we did before every measurement uh, we did a reference measurement in air to be exact we did 100 uh, Re uh, reference measurements in there, then we did 100 measurements in liquid, we cleaned the whole setup, then again 100 measurements. So every line you see here um, consists of 100 measurements and the uh, measurements in the air consist of 500 me measurements and, and just judging by eye you couldn't see any uh, deviation. These are the res results for the oscillating tube, so the mass density sensor, as you can clearly see Higher mass densities, we just used a mixture of water and isopropanol. Higher mass densities yield lower resonance frequencies. Uh, again, we did the uh, reference measurements in air, which now are 600 measurements, but you can see here you already can see a slight deviation, which in my opinion results from the fact that if you, uh, so we just blow air through the tube to clean the sensor. And through this evaporation, most likely you would cool down the tube a little bit. And this might be uh, one reason 
why it is not as stable as the viscosity sensor or another thing could be that the clamping, if you remember, this was just two screwed fiberglass blocks is not that uh, a well-defined clamping. Um, I want to show you the evaluation of these measurements for the mass density sensor. So here we have the resonance frequency over uh, mass density, uh, which can be fitted by this uh, linear function, which is depicted here. And so we need this function to be able to uh, estimate the, the stability the sensor has to have over temperature. Um, so this is done by the following grain of thought. So commercially available handheld mass density measurement setups uh, feature an accuracy of one milligram per uh, cubic centimeter. So now if we consider that the temperature measurement, which is necessary in any case for reliable measurements, is limited to uh, realistically 0.2 degree Celsius, the dependency of the resonance frequency over temperature on temperature must not be larger than uh, 0.15 Hertz per degree Celsius. Otherwise, you would have to, to get a, a more precise temperature measurement, which most likely would be hard to achieve. Um, so we did also some uh, measurements over temperature. What you see here are the, re the evaluated resonance frequencies over temperature for the new wire. And as you can see, the dependency to temperature is, is pretty weak. Uh, we try to, to do these measurements for all of our sensors. It's not finished yet. And just to have any uh, uh, comparison, what we did, we, we just went to a music store, by, uh, bought a, a, a conventional tuning, tuning fork, and what you can see here, so the absolute deviation is almost the same, the relative deviation is even better for the U-shaped wire as for the tuning fork, which I think comes from the fact that uh, stainless steel, which is used for tuning forks, or steel, um, has or the, the extension coefficient for stainless steel is the double as for tungsten, which we use for the U-shaped wire. So now let me conclude my talk. I gave, gave you an overview of our principles and the really basic theory. I showed that the U-wire on the U-tube is well suited for uh, mass density and viscosity sensing, and they are likely to be very stable devices. Regarding future work, we have now to do extensive measurings. We have to collect as much data in air in liquids as possible to be able to evaluate our theory and also our readout electronics. And with this in turn, uh, we want to be able to, uh, to estimate the accuracy you could achieve uh, with these uh, sensors. Uh, to do this, we have two machines for automated measurements. This one is self-made and the idea is that we just put the sensor in there and let the measurement run automatically for weeks or months to collect as much data as possible uh, to be able to estimate the accuracy of uh, our sensors. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.